Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today for another edition of ARENA Insight webinar series. My name is Elisa Asmelash and I'm from the ARENA Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn. Most of you know ARENA, but let me give a quick introduction of who we are. We're an intergovernmental organization with 161 member countries. We support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as a platform for international cooperation, center of excellence, and repository of policy, technology, resource, and financial knowledge on renewable energy. Our analytical work and our engagement with our member countries generates a lot of valuable insights, and we're constantly looking for more ways to share them. This is why we have launched the fortnightly IRENA Insight webinar program, where every other week we share with you key findings from our latest work, offer you insights into opportunities, trends, best practices, but also innovative solutions to address various challenges. We aim to keep these webinars short, approximately 30 minutes, so we cannot cover everything, but we hope to give you enough to decide whether to delve deeper and we will signpost further sources of more in-depth information to help you to do that. Today's webinar will be focused on the role of hydrogen, green hydrogen, in reaching zero emissions. Hydrogen from renewable power, uh, green hydrogen, has been considered a key element for the energy transition. Hydrogen technologies have been enjoying unprecedented momentum with a growing evidence in terms of their decreased costs and increased performance, suggesting they're becoming an attractive option to decarbonize global energy systems. While in the past, the major application for hydrogen favored the road transport sector, Recently, the debate surrounding hydrogen has evolved and shifted towards all hard to decarbonize sectors. Following uh, the IRENA's uh, 2019 report, Hydrogen, a Renewable Energy Perspective, this webinar will provide a more in-depth perspective on hydrogen strategic considerations, its nexus with renewable energy, its economics and trade. Our speakers today are Emanuele Taibi and Raul Miranda, our IRENA experts. They, their presentation will be a uh, maximum 20 minutes long to allow another 10 minutes for your questions. But before I hand over the microphone to Emanuele, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Next slide, please. Today's webinar will be as usually recorded and available together with the presentation slides on IRENA's web, webinar website under past webinars. The previous webinar recordings and slides are already there and we invite you to visit them. The link to the website will be again shared with you in the follow-up email. All of you are currently mu muted and will remain so throughout the webinar. Next slide, please. We would love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have any questions to our speakers, please send it uh, to us uh, through the question feature that you can find on the webinar panel. We will be monitoring questions throughout the session and select some to be answered by our speakers. Due, due to time constraints, we apologize in advance if your questions are not answered. You may also uh, download the presentation slides in the handout section that include all important links to ARENA um, um, materials. If you experience any technical difficulties, please try to reconnect by dialing in by phone. You can get the number by clicking on the phone option located on the webinar panel. Otherwise, please visit our support, the support service on the GoToWebinar website. And without um, any further ado, let me kick things off by welcoming Emanuele and Raul. Emanuele, over to you. Thank you very much, Elisa. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, wherever you might be connecting from. So it's my pleasure to, to give you a quick overview of Irina's work on green hydrogen to date and uh, some uh, insights into the, the next steps. So on the right hand side of my slide, you can see uh, a timeline of the work, re relatively recent work that we started on green hydrogen. So we had a first report uh, released in September 2018, looking at the technology outlook for hydrogen from renewable power, uh, followed by a second report in September last year, giving a renewable energy perspective uh, to hydrogen, looking at the developments and looking at the implications of the role of hydrogen for the energy transition. Uh, we have a forthcoming report that looks at a new sector, as Elisa alluded to, uh, entitled Reaching Zero with Renewables, that will have a, an important component from hydrogen as well. And uh, the hydrogen focus for this year on technology aspects is for electrolyzers. 
and this was driven by our membership's uh, demand for more focus on this uh, key technology to produce green hydrogen. In terms of outreach, uh, we engage with members uh, during a dedicated session on hydrogen at the Arena Innovation Week in uh, September 2018. Uh, and then we follow that with a first uh, thematic meeting on uh, decarbonizing, uh, hard to decarbonize sectors at the I-18 Arena Council. Uh, we uh, scaled that up to a ministerial roundtable discussion in January uh, at the 10th Assembly of Irina. Uh, where we had a very good dialogue between uh, ministers and CEOs for key uh, private sector entities and a mandate to continue this dialogue through a collaborative framework on green hydrogen, which we will say a few words uh, later on. So the role of hydrogen in the energy transition. Uh, essentially, the way we look at it is to take renewable electricity, which is um, in more and more jurisdiction, the cheapest uh, source of electricity uh, and uh, growing at scale very rapidly uh, into end use sectors through essentially electrolysis. So taking renewable electricity, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen and using the hydrogen to decarbonize sectors that would benefit from molecules. So that have difficulties in being directly electrified. A lot of that is industry, very important role also in transport, uh, potentially a role in buildings and power, and we will look at it more in details. So in terms of transport, uh, of course, fuel cell electric vehicles are the key technology there. Uh, the performance remains very similar to, to conventional vehicle, and it's a more efficient drivetrain being an electric drivetrain complementary to battery electric vehicles, important to note. It's not mutually exclusive, but there is a very good space for complementarity. Uh, and then, of course, what is very important to go uh, deeper into decarbonization, trying to reach zero as today's title, uh, is really to deploy that into rail aviation and maritime sector, where there is really little options uh, beyond hydrogen and hydrogen-derived fuels. Industry. Uh, as we've been observing uh, during the last few months, coal is going out of power generation in more and more countries. Uh, however, industry is a different picture and direct electrification in industry is important, but for many heavy industry sectors will be necessary to have a combination of bioenergy and hydrogen to decarbonize the sector. And of course, uh, changing processes would enable an even better deployment of hydrogen, for instance, uh, doing direct reduction of iron ore with hydrogen instead of blast furnace requires a changing process that would enable a better uptake of hydrogen. And then finally, decarbonizing the gas grid. Uh, there is significant infrastructure for natural gas in place that uh, hydrogen can help into gradually decarbonize until it becomes the dominant form of uh, gas molecules uh, for, for a system. And then, of course, this can be combined with the provision of, uh, let's say, sector coupling related flexibility from the electrolyzers to the gas grid and from the gas grid back to the power sector through fuel cells. And this is a very interesting proposition to go towards zero. Uh, the latest ARENA Global Renewables Outlook 2050 uh, gives a perspective uh, on uh, different scenarios for hydrogen. So the global scenario based on current policies uh, as a green hydrogen contribution of about 3% and a blue hydrogen contribution of ab about the same amount. But to be compliant with the Paris Agreement in our transforming energy scenario, we need to scale up green hydrogen to 7% and consequently reducing a bit further blue hydrogen to 1%. But overall, increasing hydrogen is very important. At the same time, this capacity will provides significant flexibility for the power system. As you can see, uh, at the second row from the bottom electrolyzers, today's electrolyzer capacity is in the, uh, in the hundreds of megawatt at best. Uh, and what we need is thousands of gigawatt for a Paris compliance scenario by 2050. So the 1700 gigawatt is the number to keep in mind. This is the market for electrolyzers to produce 7% uh, of emission reduction to green hydrogen. So a significant scale up that is needed, and this is one of the key points for today. 
This would allow us to reach hydrogen production cost between one and two dollars per kilogram, uh, and of course, uh, a significant uh, scale up of solar and wind capacity to be able to produce this hydrogen will be necessary. Now, looking at emission reduction, so this slide is uh, fairly complicated, but what is the key message here is that we have a suite of options, renewables, energy efficiency, uh, electric vehicles, hydrogen, and a few others uh, that are kind of marginal in these scenarios uh, to decarbonize. So the first 29% uh, of emission reductions that you can see here is coming mostly from renewables and energy efficiency and electric vehicles. Uh, there is a 3% contribution from hydrogen in the planned energy scenario. Moving to the transforming energy scenario, which is our Paris compliance scenario, uh, we see a bigger role for hydrogen going from 3 to 6% of the reduction. Uh, and of course, the, the key role remains renewables and energy efficiency uh, together with electrification. But what is interesting here for the first time, we give a, a, a getting to zero perspective, trying to, to look at perspectives to reach zero or net zero and what would be the implication there. And so there is additional potential to be leveraged from renewables and efficiency. But as you can see, this is where hydrogen enters the two digits uh, emission reduction contribution. And so we have 14 to 23 percent reduction potentially coming from hydrogen. So the key message here is that it is really for this uh, final mile of decarbonization that we will need hydrogen. There will be little alternative options to do so. So apart from the competition with other options, it's really fundamental that at one point we are ready with technology at scale and cost to be able to do this last mile. And then when we look at the whole uh, changes from today's baseline and to get into zero, these are all the options put together. And you can see that the overall picture is about 8% of the reduction uh, potentially coming from green hydrogen in the overall picture. And this, of course, uh, means significant additional uh, renewable capacity in the electric system. Giving a brief perspective on cost, uh, so we have a lot of more detail on the costing of uh, green hydrogen, but this is a simple chart that we use to give the overall picture. So on the conservative side, uh, looking at electrolyzer uh, capex of about $840 a kilowatt, which by today's standard is already too high, uh, we would need the cheapest electricity that we are uh, seeing through large-scale PPAs around the world to start to be competitive with blue hydrogen. So this 2.51 is the upper end of the cost of producing hydrogen with fossil fuels plus CCS, so blue hydrogen. Uh, what is interesting is that we are already below that $20 a megawatt hour in the best cases. So there are PPAs now at $15 a megawatt hour uh, around the world for solar and wind, and we are already below uh, $840 a kilowatt for electrolyzers. We're seeing projects that are getting close to 500. And then looking at a very aggressive scenario for, for electrolyzers, $200 per kilowatt, uh, potentially as a target price for 2050. Then we are really on the lower end of the competitiveness with fossil fuel plus CCS, keeping in mind that there would be remaining emissions from CCS. It's not 100% capture. So this is the only way to get to zero, and it starts to get very competitive uh, faster than everybody expected probably one or two years ago. And for that reason, uh, we've been focusing this year our analysis on electrolysis uh, as the key technology to take this uh, very competitive uh, variable resources from the power system and produce green molecules to decarbonize the rest of the energy system. So the key drivers there, renewable costs continue to fall. We just released our latest costing report. They show that in more and more countries, again, renewables are becoming the cheapest option, even cheaper than running existing coal power plants, not installing new, but running existing ones. Uh, there are some system integration challenges. Uh, Europe has been coping extremely well with uh, shares of above 50% of variable resources. Uh, in many countries over the last few months due to a drop in demand and an increase in renewables capacity. But to get to the last mile to a completely decarbonized power sector, hydrogen will have a key role to play. 
and uh, the projects as you see on the bottom right side are growing rapidly in size and numbers and that will drive the cost reduction that we need so cost is projected to half, and my colleague Raul will give you more details on that so it is a key and necessary solution to get to zero emissions uh, we will focus our report on uh, project cost, equipment cost trends, uh, efficiency, lifetime, in general performance uh, from different aspects, not just efficiency, but also flexibility, and looking at how these projects can make revenues. We released in March a report on, on electricity storage that really looks at how these projects can make revenues beyond the energy market, and I think something similar would be also interesting for electrolyzers, as they would be competing into the grid services market. And of course, the role of innovation would be very important there to look at new technologies and how can be uh, deployed to be disruptive and bringing the cost down faster and keeping track of the last projects. And I think with this, I would just uh, leave it to my colleague Raul, Raul to give you more information about our work in this space. Thank you very much. Over to you, Raul. Thank you, Emanuele. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So, continuing the presentation, um, as just mentioned in uh, by Emanuele, so the scale up of electrolyzers are, are uh, critical to reduce uh, costs, uh, both both in terms of number of projects and also the installed capacity size of hydrogen uh, facilities. Um, so, basically, going from a kilowatt scale to a mega, megawatt or even a gigawatt scale uh, in the short um, to medium term. So this is a chart from a recent study uh, made by NREL. And what we can see in this chart is an estimation of economies of scale and uh, overall uh, reduction of costs uh, as you increase uh, production rates. So what it shows to us is that um, as soon as you get to a gigawatt factory, uh, which would be um, a nearly uh, production rate of uh, 1,000 units, which seems to be um, a reasonable number. The stack components of cost, which is indicated uh, by this uh, the lower uh, arrow, uh, seems to achieve a relatively uh, lower uh, threshold, and apparently uh, cost uh, wouldn't go much lower um, after this point. Uh, and in the end, you would get a uh, stack cost a bit above uh, $100 uh, per kilowatt. So from a gigawatt production capacity, uh, if you continue scaling up, you keep reducing a balance of cost uh, further, but not much of, of, uh, of uh, not much of uh, regarding a uh, stack cost. So, uh, but based on this uh, in, in a real chart, uh, the main point here is that as soon as you get to a gigawatt production capacity, it allows the technology, so electrolyzers, to achieve uh, a cost around uh, $300 uh, per kilowatt, which is already uh, would be already a good uh, stage, let's say, for the technology uh, competitiveness in comparison uh, to fossil fuel technologies. And, and just to mention, these numbers are for a PEM plant. So alkaline is a bit more um, consolidated technology uh, and these dynamics should be uh, a bit di different. So next slide, please. Uh, so what is the current situations? So as also Emanuele uh, mentioned, uh, the critical factors defining hydrogen production costs are the cost of elect the electricity, uh, capital costs of the electrolyzer and operation load factors. Um, and in terms of com competitiveness uh, costs, uh, we've seen that uh, hydrogen from renewables needs to achieve uh, levels more or less uh, below two uh, US dollars uh, per kilogram of hydrogen to start being uh, to having uh, some uh, real to be real competitive uh, with hydrogen uh, from fossil fuels. So in terms of cost of renewables, uh, these have been seen below uh, $20 uh, per megawatt hour. Uh, for instance, um, in countries such as Brazil, Portugal, United Arab Emirates or US and many others. Uh, of course, not considering uh, transmission costs. So this is only the generation cost. Um, and these, of course, are um, very least uh, cost projects. 
but uh, anyway, renewables costs are expected to further decrease and such projects are likely uh, to be um, um, more and more uh, common. So uh, for the, the cost of the electrolyzers, so according to that, to that chart from NRL, we would be at uh, around $550 uh, per kilowatt uh, for PEM technology. Uh, of course, some sources mention uh, higher values as well. So um, more or less on a range from 800 to 600. Um, of course, also depending uh, if we are talking about alkaline or PEM. Uh, so, uh, but what you can see from this chart below uh, in general is that uh, as operating hours increase, so the hours of operation uh, of your electrolyzer on a year basis, the impact of capex costs on the final uh, hydrogen cost decreases and the impact of electricity costs uh, will increase, which can uh, in different ways uh, be noted in, uh, in both charts. So, uh, so for instance, the chart from the left shows uh, which would be the cost to produce hydrogen um, for different uh, investment costs. So uh, for the electrolyzer, and considering a, a fixed uh, $20 uh, per megawatt hour uh, cost for electricity. So the power price uh, wouldn't uh, vary in this case. So it would not, for instance, it wouldn't uh, vary as it would be the case uh, in, in a power market. Uh, and in this situation, hydrogen costs get below uh, $2 per kilogram of hydrogen uh, for electrolyzers costs of around uh, 550 and below, considering operating hours slightly above uh, for a thousand hours. And of course, for a cap for a capacity of uh, 350, this uh, would come uh, even earlier. So, uh, and on the chart of the right, what we did, we did the opposite. So we fixed the electrolyzer investment cost at 350. Uh, so a bit higher than that uh, $300 um, dollars per kilowatt from that uh, NREL chart. Uh, for a gigawatt production capacity. And here we can see uh, different costs for the renewable electricity. So in this chart, uh, uh, the, the, the level below uh, $2 per, per kilogram of hydrogen would be achieved earlier at around uh, 3,000 hours, illustrating where hydrogen costs could be perhaps um, even around uh, 2030 if we start uh, scaling up electrolyzers uh, today. Uh, also interesting to note as well is that hydrogen production with zero or very low cost surplus uh, generation uh, in principle would be um, competitive, let's say around um, with a load factor of around uh, 2000 hours, uh, considering of course that, uh, that level that I said of uh, $2 per kilogram of hydrogen. So, uh, so this uh, picture would be already a quite uh, interesting uh, range, uh, getting renewables competitive with uh, blue hydrogen and getting closer and closer to, to gray hydrogen uh, territory. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so going uh, back a bit uh, to uh, green hydrogen applications, uh, Emanuele previously presented the role of green hydrogen uh, for the decarbonization of the global energy system. Uh, another interesting application is helping the integration of uh, variable renewables. Um, so one of, the, one of these applications, it would be um, using hydrogen to store solar and wind energy uh, over uh, long periods of time. So the figure below, uh, for instance, the one uh, on the left, uh, illustrates what would be uh, this case uh, for Germany in uh, 2050. So basically, um, hydrogen could be stored in different ways, uh, but on a large scale, what what would be uh, needed in 2050? Maybe uh, there are two that we could highlight. Um, the first one would be um, in gas grids, either uh, dedicated hydrogen grids or uh, blended with natural gas. Uh, injections in gas grids could also allow um, uh, continuous operation of electrolyzers, which also uh, could, could help um, uh, with the economics of, uh, of electrolyzers. And blending as well uh, would be particular uh, interesting uh, opportunity uh, for natural gas networks that could 
or that would possibly be decommissioned uh, in the, let's say, in the medium to long term. Uh, in principle, blending up to 5% could be done uh, with little cost, uh, but 10 to 20% is also uh, uh, an option. So the next slide, um, before finishing our presentation, we would like to mention the Ministerial Roundtable on Green Hydrogen, organized by ARENA and held during ARENA's uh, last assembly on January uh, 2020, where countries and stakeholders uh, from the private sector had the opportunity to debate the potential of grid hydrogen and its relevance in a different uh, national energy context. And as you can see in the picture we had in the ministerial, um, the, participation, the participation of uh, Fatih Biro, uh, executive director of IEA, uh, who for instance highlighted the importance of hydrogen for the decarbonization of the so-called uh, hard to decarbonize sectors. Uh, also, of course, IRENA's uh, Director General, Francesco La Camera, who mentioned the quite unique momentum for green hydrogen and its uh, development um, at this stage. And also uh, His Ex Excellency uh, Claude Toombs, Minister of Energy of Luxembourg, who um, emphasized uh, the need to reduce costs uh, of electrolyzers, which is indeed the focus of uh, IRENA's analysis uh, this year. So next slide. So this is our uh, last slide. Uh, so during, during the, the ministerial, uh, members called up ARENA as the lead intergovernmental inter organization mandated to promote renewable energy and support countries uh, in their energy transformation um, to continue its work on hydrogen from new power and uh, building on the productive uh, discussions in the ministerial, in the ministerial roundtable, um, to use its global networks to facilitate uh, partnerships and uh, knowledge exchange between the, between uh, countries and and uh, and of course with uh, the private sectors. So in re in response to these requests, Irena is establishing a collaborative uh, framework on green hydrogen, as also as already mentioned uh, by Emanuele for which a virtual meeting uh, with member countries uh, was held on uh, 18 of June, uh, 2020. Um, and during this meeting, a list of strategic uh, direction activities uh, was mentioned by members, among which can be highlighted uh, to strengthen the collaboration between the arena and other uh, existing initiatives on hydrogen and the, ext the establishment of a global knowledge database on green hydrogen to disseminate the knowledge on green hydrogen related topics such as logistics, standards, and regulatory frameworks, as well as on the, the sharing of best practice, uh, practices on financial uh, mechanisms. So with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you, and Elisa, over to you. Thank you, Manuela and Raul, for the insightful presentation. Let me go directly to the questions. We already received several ones. Thank you for them. Let me start with this one. Focus on electrolyzers is good as they make um, the major cost for green hydrogen. Can you say something on the scale of renewable energy that would be required to support test or pass scenarios and the investments required in renewable energy? Thank you, Elisa. Uh, I put back on, on the screen the, the slide with these uh, figures. So I think this is a very, very important point as the amount of electricity from renewables required to produce uh, hydrogen, it really depends on how the hydrogen is used. So it is not a simple question. We have, of course, our estimate there, as you can see, electricity demand to produce hydrogen from renewables. The bottom right in the plant energy scenarios, 1,200 terawatt hours. In 2050, in the transforming energy scenario, it goes up to 7,500 terawatt hours. Uh, but of course, uh, if you're producing hydrogen, you're shipping it on the other side of the planet, and then you are taking it back to a power plant uh, with low efficiency, the overall amount of uh, electricity you need from renewables is much higher because you have more losses in the system. 
if you produce it uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum on site for directly utilizing it, then the efficiency of the, the overall chain is much higher. So essentially this, this estimate is also based on our estimate of how the hydrogen will be used. Thank you, Manuele. Another question, uh, why spread our efforts and money on hydrogen for transport, cars and trucks, where all studies show that e-mobility is far uh, more efficient and competitive? Thank you. This is a very good question. So we started, I think, the hydrogen discussion for those of you that were already in this sector over 15 years ago, really looking at cars. And this narrative has changed because with the Paris Agreement, now the focus is to reach zero. So how to decarbonize uh, all the sectors. So the main idea there is that uh, we need hydrogen in all the sectors, as we discussed uh, previously. So we have this slide where it shows where hydrogen can make a contribution. But of course, we need to start with large demand. So to be able to scale up uh, the production of electrolyzers and bring down the cost, we need large off takers to start with. Then at one point, we will need to deploy hydrogen in all sectors. So uh, we are not diluting the efforts, but it's important to prioritize the efforts to, to be able to, to get up to scale and bring down the cost as quickly as possible in the next decade. Thank you, Manuele. I'll take another question. Would you have an idea of the yield of an, electro an electrolyzer, especially compared to battery storage? Thank you, Elisa. Uh, on this one, I think what is important is the part where you say compared to batteries, because I think in our view, uh, it is not to be compared with batteries. These are complementary technologies that sit at the opposite end of the spectrum of flexibility options. Batteries are very, very quick in responding and extremely efficient, extremely efficient from going from electricity back to electricity. Hydrogen is much better suited for large scale long term storage and providing this kind of flexibility services and even adequacy to the power system, but especially to go into the end use sectors where batteries cannot be deployed. So again, in the transportation sector, there will be battery electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles, depending on the application. Heavy duty, long distance, I turnover, more fuel cells and uh, let's say city cars, definitely battery, battery electric vehicles have already taken off at much uh, faster pace. Thank you, Emanuele. I think we have uh, still some time for a couple of questions. Um, what do you think about mixing green hydrogen into existing natural gas pipelines up to a 3% as a driver to create the, the demand needed to scale up green hydrogen production and therefore electrolyzers? This okay, is a, uh, okay. okay, all over go, to you. Go. Okay, uh, well, in, uh, in this case, uh, well, optimal blending concentrations, uh, of course, uh, strongly uh, would depend on the characteristics of uh, the existing network um, and uh, on the gas uh, composition and, of course, end use applications. Uh, indeed, uh, there are some studies uh, mentioned that, for instance, a mandate of a 5% blend uh, in the European uh, gas network would allow uh, to have to scale up uh, electrolyzers up to around uh, 50 uh, to 70 gigawatts um, of capacity. So indeed, this would this could be um, um, an efficient uh, strategy to scale up. Of course, there are uh, many challenges that should still should be uh, overcome. Uh, so uh, related to regulatory uh, frameworks and also, of course. Uh, maybe to materials and uh, and also related uh, technical aspects uh, related to the gas grids, but indeed is a, is a it can be a, a, it can play a, an important role on uh, scaling up uh, electrolyzers. Uh, thank you, Raúl. Uh, maybe I'll just ask one last question because we're running out of time. Um, what are the industries where you see the greatest potential from green hydrogen in terms of decarbonization? I think we already have the right slide on screen. Uh, this doesn't go into much of the details, but it shows two uh, because of uh, reasons of space. 
So where do you need more than, uh, let's say, medium temperature heat, so high temperature heat industries, and for feedstocks. So I think this is a, is a very good, uh, important starting point, is, is this... Uh, uh, industries are very energy intensive and a lot of them rely heavily on coal and so in terms of emission reduction this is a very good point to start and uh, there are uh, elements where really we can uh, combine uh, changes in processes to increase the efficiency and to enable the uptake of hydrogen so I think we have a paper on uh, uh, iron and steel that is quite relevant for this discussion uh, but of course, uh, all the heavy industries can benefit from a combination of electrification where possible, uh, shift in, uh, in uh, processes and uptake of green hydrogen for both energy and feedstocks. And I think this will be uh, a good way to close the webinar saying that the next report uh, from IRENA uh, in this direction reaching zero uh, will have a deep dive into this uh, sector in particular in industry will be an important one that will be uh, thoroughly discussed. Thank you, Manuele. Unfortunately, time is up. Thank you for sending us insightful questions to choose from, and thank you so much. And thank you so much to Emanuele and Raúl uh, for sharing all of these insights and your experience with us. Let me finish this very interesting webinar with a couple of final announcements. Um, to be able to reflect on the delivery of our webinar and ways to improve it, and also what else you would like us to cover in future editions, we would appreciate your feedback. We would like to invite you to complete a very short satisfactory survey, which will appear at the end of the webinar, and the link will be shared with you also in the follow-up email. We're monitoring our comments and we um, work on selecting topics of your interest and trying to shift times of webinars to accommodate uh, various time zones. Thank you in advance for completing the survey, which has been very helpful. And last but not least, we would like to invite you to another webinar on dynamic regulation and innovations in enabling technologies for a renewable power future on 20th of July at 4 p.m. Central Eastern Time. You can already register on the ARENA website and the link will be again shared with you in our follow-up email. You can reg register on ARENA website. The link is shared here in the presentations with you and you will receive a follow-up email with the links as well. So that is all from us today. Once again, I would like to thank our speakers and all of you for joining us. Goodbye and see you soon.